Well, church, at this time, it's uh, time to stand for our reading today, which comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. And it says this, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Please welcome Scott as he brings us around the word. Hey. How you going, church? Not bad yourself? Take your seats, give someone next to you a high five. How are you? You doing well? It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. You know it's all about Christmas presents, don't you? (laughs) This is our time, Christmas time. I thought it would be really, really appropriate to... Sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing this morning. Did you enjoy that? A little bit of a different rendition. Thank you. Muso team have just been raptured. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, I'm left behind. (laughs) Oh, very good. How many of you love Romans 8? Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good. I'm going to read that again. And we know that all things work together for good. We're going to come back to that in a little while, but that's where I want to drive the message this morning. Title of my message this morning is His Good Purpose. Turn to the person next to you and say, His Good Purpose. His Good Purpose. His Good Purpose. It was written in 1739 by a man by the name of Charles Wesley. He wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing, 1739. My assumption is it didn't quite sound the same as what we just heard, a little bit different, but it was originally written as a Christmas Day song service, uh, for the service, sorry, I should say, and it was later adapted by a man by the name of George Whitfield and other couple of uh, revivalist preachers. These guys were known as starting the, the Methodist Church, as we know today. Whitfield was, a, was an amazing preacher and um, saw millions, just like Reinhardt. We just saw, saw millions come to the Lord and what is believed to be the start of the Great Awakening in America in, uh, in the 1700s there. And uh, every time we get around Christmas time, I kind of think that it's a little bit of a shame that we visit the Christmas story just on Christmas Day. So if it's all right with you, I want to visit it this morning. Is that okay this morning? Hark the herald angels sing. I'm going to read it to you. Have a listen to this. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. I'm holding it together. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Don't know why. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. He was born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. How good is that? (laughs) Charles Wesley wrote over 6,000 songs. 6,000 hymns. Pretty amazing. One of them would be one of my favourites, That Could It Be. Does anyone anyone old, old enough here remember that song? How could it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Died he for me, I caused his pain. 
I to him did death pursue. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Christmas time is not about presents. It's not about a fat man in a red suit. It's actually not about family. It's about the birth of the Messiah. It's about Jesus. It's about his coming. And I would wonder if this morning you would turn with me to Luke. Let's have a Luke at Luke. Sorry, it's a dad joke. I've been a dad for a while now. This is our text we're going to look at this morning. How many ladies are in the house? We're going to read the story from the pretty much the ladies' perspective in the book of Luke. It's Mary's kind of side of things. Um, and as we read this, I just want you to note this young woman of God. We're going to read from Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. And it says this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent, to God, sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, so royal line, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Absolutely. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived in her old age and this is now, and, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Verse 37, read it with me. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel of the Lord departed from her. That is incredible. I want you to note this morning that she was probably around about 14. It's probably around 14. The angel visits her and says, You're favoured, you found favour with the Lord. I've got a plan. Father has a plan. You're going to have a son. Joseph's not going to be the father. In fact, the father is going to be none other than the father himself. God will be his father. Therefore, he will be known as the son of God. You know, no time in the scripture was Joseph ever um, known to be the father of Jesus. It was always Jesus, the son of God. Could you imagine, just for a moment, this 14-year-old girl gets this word and just like that, she says, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. What a young lady. That's amazing. I wonder if we'd ever be into that kind of obedience. We heard about obedience just before. That kind of obedience, she says, yep, Lord, whatever you say, goes. Let it be to me according to your word. Could you imagine, after they've had the child, they're looking at this child, Joseph and Mary, they're looking at this baby. What sort of promise? What sort of hope? What sort of wonder they're thinking as they're looking at this baby? You've got to understand that for thousands of years, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come, that he would be the ruler and reign he would rule and reign over Israel and all the world, that his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And Mary knows that this little man that she's just had is him. 
Imagine what they're doing when they're seeing him grow up. Even in his teenagers, teenage years, I was thinking, imagine he, you know, gets in trouble. If I was Joseph, I wouldn't want to smack him. <laughs> My guess is he probably didn't muck up. He's probably a good boy. But a boy nonetheless, she watched him grow up. This you and I know now as the eternal son of God. He who was before is veiled in flesh. Amazing. He was destined to be the ruler and his kingdom would be a forever kingdom. And they're looking at this little baby. Could you imagine what must have been going through their head? But although there was also the, the, the wonder and the amazement and the, the hope and the promise that was there wrapped up in this little baby, there was also reproach. Did you know that both Joseph and Mary would have suffered reproach for God's will their whole lives? You see, Joseph at that point, before he even knew that it was a, a God child, it was the God child, he actually heard that Mary uh, was up the duff. She was pregnant. Now, I don't know about you, but there's only really one way in this world that you become pregnant, and that's if you uh, know a man, if we're going to put it in scriptural terms. So obviously, according to Joseph, Mary's made a big mistake. He had every legal right according to Jewish law, to publicly announce a divorce. And in fact, the Bible says that he contemplated it. He was actually thinking about these things. What do I do? What do I do? I want you to notice that what he said, and it's in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 19. I'll read it for you. But it says, Then Joseph, being a just man, same word for righteousness, a righteous man, a just man. Then Joseph, her husband, notice that it's her husband. They haven't come together. Remember a few weeks ago I said, once you're betrothed, that's it, you're done. That's why you have to get a divorce. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. I find that really interesting that here in the same vain as being a just and righteous man, he actually loved her and wanted to cover her. He had every right to publicly announce, to clear his own name, but no, he was righteous. And because he was righteous, he decided in love that he didn't want to shame her. I find that really interesting because I know that a lot of times we can be just and righteous and want to expose. But my Bible says that when you're like that, you're acting in love and you're actually wanting to cover. Just thought I'd throw that in one for free. <laughs> but I know that for all their life, they would have had to have suffered some sort of reproach. The reason being is because obviously we know that the angel had visited Joseph and basically said, don't be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary home as your wife or what is in her is of the Holy Spirit. And you're to call his name Jesus. He'll be known as the Son of God because he's going to save his people from their sins. Joseph does that and uh, he's obedient. Now think about it for a second. Mary's, in the eyes of everybody else, has made a mistake but now Joseph has married into, if you like, this same decision. Everybody would have thought that Mary stuffed up. But now they would have thought that Joseph was the one who kind of upset the apple cart, if you like. How do I know this? When Jesus was in his ministry... And he's having a go at the Pharisees and he's trying to give them an idea of their parentage. If you remember, he says, you are of your father, the what? The devil, who's a liar and the father of lies. Well, of course, they get upset at him. 
And their rhetoric is this. In verse eight, uh, chapter 8 and verse 41 of John, it says, we were not born of fornication. That's what they said to him. They are alluding to this time right now. All his life, Jesus would have been what they just called him, forgive me for saying this, a bastard. He was illegitimate. But Mary and Joseph were unfaithful, if you like, to the law. You know, sometimes you and I can be doing the will of God. And this is where I really want to drive this this morning, is that we can be doing God's will and we can be in circumstances that on the outside, everybody might look at it and say, you know, whatever they want to say. And you might suffer reproach, but it's actually in the perfect will of God. Think about that for a second. Mary and Joseph suffered reproach for his good purpose. I want you to know this morning that this message, this word and everything in it is not plan B. Are you hearing me this morning, church? This is not plan B. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his final return for his own, which is coming, his final judgment, his ruling from Israel over the whole nations, all the nations, has always been his plan and always will be. There is no plan B for God. Despite popular belief, God actually doesn't need contingencies. Are you hearing me this morning? He doesn't need contingencies. You and I plan, okay, but then we have contingencies if things don't go quite according to plan. I'm here to tell you this morning, that's not how God operates. We need to get this this morning. This is so important for our understanding. This is like theology proper. When God plans, he is able to make his plans come to fruition exactly the way that he's planned them, exactly the way that he's declared them. That has tremendous implications for you and I. Because we just read a moment ago and know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. We'll get back to that. Here's some Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ, his birth. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Shall call his name Emmanuel. Another one. Isaiah 9, verse, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Always quoted around Christmas time. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to know this morning that Isaiah prophesied that between the time of 740 and 686 BC. Six to seven hundred years before Jesus came, those words were written. Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem, if, if Ethrath, I can't even read that right. Though you are little among the, the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who will be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. It's from this verse that Jews know that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. But if they looked a little bit forward from that, they'd also see that not only will the Messiah come from Bethlehem, that it will be also the eternal God. Because it says, from his goings forth or from old, from everlasting. Micah, just so you know, prophesied from 737 to 696 BC. Hosea 11.1 1 says, when, the ch when is uh, Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called, his son, called my son. And we know that when, you know, 
the, the babes were getting killed in Bethlehem. They went to Egypt to escape um, Herod. And then uh, Jesus came back out of Egypt, 750 to 725 BC. Just one more I'll give you. And these are a few, just a few, literally just a few of just his birth, prophecies of his birth surrounding his coming. Psalm 2, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations for your inheritance, the end of, of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2, verses 7 to 9, probably a thousand years before Jesus. Why do I show you all this? Because I want to nail home the point that God has had a plan the whole time. God has had a plan the whole time. He's written it in specific detail. In fact, he is so articulate, if you read something like Psalm 22, which is a picture of Jesus on the cross, it's almost like he is writing it verbatim. And so he should. The eternal one knows the, the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. In fact, he plans exactly how it's all going to happen. See, this is a point of, of God not just knowing what's going to happen, but the fact that he planned all the details from the beginning. So you and I would only need to read Genesis chapter 3, when it says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. You see, God knew right from the beginning that Jesus was going to come. Are you hearing me this morning, church? I know it seems a little bit slow, and these are things that you know, but these are so important to remind ourselves because with God there is no plan B, not only for the Son but also for you. I'll say that again. There's no plan B for you. There's no plan B. It's only God's plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Who wants to receive that this morning? I've always said it's really, really good passage of Scripture, but kind of annoying for someone like myself because God knows the plans he has for me. I just wish he would share them with me. <laughs> The thing I do know is that there are plans to prosper me. Some of you need to hear this this morning. They're good plans. It's his good purpose. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. In, amongst, and all around the stuff that happens in your life. We're going to read it. We're going to get back to Romans chapter 8 in a moment. God to me is fascinating. Jesus truly is our Emmanuel. Amen. Amen. He's God with us. God with us. Hail the incarnate deity. God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. John says, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. The birth of Christ was part of God's plan and it's our privilege to know. Did you know that God loves you this morning? Yes. This is a love that goes beyond anything that you've ever experienced. This is a love that only you can know if you meet him, if you connect with him. It's only in this point that you will know that God truly loves you. You see, the Bible does tell us that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, 
but have everlasting life. The reason Jesus came is because he loved you. Why do I harp on about this this morning? Because this is Christmas time. This is the gospel. This is our time, church. We can be a bit scroogey at Christmas time because we know that it's what it's all about and we know that it's not about the presents and the car parks and the... How many of you get upset about that sort of stuff sometimes? But this is a time that we've got to go, you know what? I'm going to take this opportunity to witness to my family yet again. Witness to my loved ones yet again. To proclaim that this is all about Jesus. To proclaim the eternal Son of God loved us so much that He came. He didn't leave us alone. He's a good God. And just as George, you know, I was going through this and I'm thinking, my goodness, it's exactly the same as what Pastor George preached last week. I kind of discover this after the fact. I kind of, God just puts this kind of thing and I kind of flesh it out, if you like, when I'm writing a sermon and I'm kind of like, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of what George preached last week. As I was with, so I will be with, remember? Perhaps some of us are forgetting that. Maybe that's why God wants to remind us this morning. Pleased as man with men to dwell. I've got no idea why. True? (laughs) I know myself. That's why I love that song. How could it be that thou, my God, would die for me? I have no idea. Yet he does. He loves me. He loves you this morning. You might be here this morning and you've never met Jesus. My prayer for you this morning is that truly you would come to know him. Either this morning, tomorrow, this Christmas time, this season. Jesus paid a tremendous price so that you would come to know him. God gave you a gift. It was in the form of his son. His name's Jesus. His name's Jesus. <laughs> You see, in this little baby, is the creator. This has never ceased to blow my mind. Think about it. You've got mum and dad, you've got this little baby, yet the scripture declares to us that the worlds were made through him. That's fascinating. I remember years ago, I don't know if I've told you this before, I was, I was witnessing to some Muslim guys at our work. I, I used to do picking, um, line picking uh, for, it doesn't matter anyway. I was working and, um, yeah, that's me just reeling it in, yeah, not going on. But I was uh, working and um, we'd have this banter all the time, you know, they'd, they'd come up and they were trying to witness to me and I was witnessing to them and, and um and they were great guys. I love them. And, and, you know, they were really good. I mean, they were trying to explain to me that um, this baby could not have been God. How blasphemous to think that Allah, the great God, as they proclaim, could be flesh. Good question. He actually said to me one day, he goes, how could this baby be God? And it's like, I said to him, I remember saying, oh, I'll get back to you on that one. (laughs) And then I found Colossians. Chapter 2 and verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the deity in bodily form. Friend, They might have gone, what does that mean? But this is the mystery that you and I proclaim. That this person of Jesus was actually God in the flesh. Jesus, the eternal son of God. This baby 
entered creation, yet he was the creator. I've said it before. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in very form God, did not consider robbery with God, or robbery to be equal with God, I should say. Hebrews 1, chapter 1 and 3, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the worlds. <laughs> Amazing. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, I like what the NIV says, it says the exact representation of his being, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made himself, uh, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Everything that we read, his birth, his death, his resurrection, everything in between and everything that is to come will be fulfilled. Jesus said himself, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It will be fulfilled, every single one of them. Every single one of them. And I like, I, I take... I take great pleasure in knowing that. And let me tell you why. Because all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. Let's read it. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's on a mission for you. And that is to conform you to the image of his son. Now, we've just read that God's got a plan for you. To conform you into the likeness of his son. Based on what we've just learnt this morning, let me ask you the question, do you think God has a plan B? That means whatever happens in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, God will eventually conform you into the image of his son. That's good news this morning. Five people think that's good. I'm getting somewhere this morning. That to me is incredible. That means you can relax. Rest, yeah. That means you can trust. Trust in a God who has it all sussed for real. I used to say it all the time from the pulpit. God has it sussed. He's got you covered. He really has. How many of you have been around long enough to know that when you make mistakes, you kind of think you've stuffed up God's will, right? You've done it. You've, you've blown it somehow. You've been going on the railway tracks of the will of God and you've made a mistake and now you're over here and you think that somehow you've got to get back over here to get back onto the will of God, but then you're over here and then you realise, oh, God sussed that out all, all, all along. God knew exactly what I was going to do. He just used even my bad and I'm still in God's will. Yep. That's how powerful he is. That's how powerful he is. You see, when you come to Christ and you begin to learn about God, you learn three attributes, if you like. His omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. Omnipotence means he's all powerful. Omnipresence means he's everywhere at all times. And his omniscience means that he knows everything. Omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. It's about time we believed it for our own lives. He knows what you're going to do before you do it. He knows what you say before you say it. 
he numbers the hair on your head or the lack thereof. <laughs> and all the men said, Amen. the bald men, <laughs> hallelujah. He might not be in double numbers for some of us, but that's okay. God is a good God. All the time, God is good. And therefore, when we look at Romans chapter 8, and Romans chapter 8, my goodness. How many of you loved Romans chapter 8? My goodness, the crescendo of the, I don't know. I love what Chuck Missler says. He always has to look every day to see if Romans chapter 8 is still in his Bible. And it's so true. You get from Romans chapter 3, I'm a stinking sinner. Romans chapter 5, I can't do anything about it. Romans chapter 6, I'm, 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 I'm in trouble. Romans chapter 7, I've got this wrestle going on. The good that I want to do, I can't do. The bad that I don't want to do, this I do. Who's going to rescue me? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I love it. So good. And we know. Everybody say, we know. We know all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. How many of you love the Lord this morning? So God works all things together for the good of those that love the Lord. That's you. That word for all things. Now, I know you know that I'm a, I'm a really fluent Greek speaker. All things means all things in the Greek. I looked it up. <laughs> Some of you will get my humour maybe on the way home. I don't know. All things actually means the collective of everything. Yes. You need to capture that this morning. The collective of everything. That's what he means when he says all things. God will use all things. The good, the bad, the ugly. All things work together for the good. That word work together is actually the same word that you and I get synchronised. I can't pronounce it in Greek. Synchronizo. That's a good attempt. But that's what it means. So God takes everything, right? This God who knows everything, sees everything, okay? He takes it all and he's on a mission to make you like his son. He takes it all and he synchronizes it all together for your good. That's good news this morning, church. That's good news. That's really good news. I kind of wondered why God would want to address us at this stage with this particular word. And, you know, I re actually really felt like I wanted to just talk about... God and his divine nature and these are things that I love so that's just where I love to go and, and I kind of felt that you know Christmas time is such a great time to focus on the birth of the son that it is a time where the gospel needs to be preached and, and out there because it's our time hello church it's our time yeah. But in and amongst all that, I really felt like that Romans chapter 8 verse, God really wanted to slot that in. Spoke to a brother this morning and he even said, God led him in to Romans chapter 8 this morning. I just know that somehow, some way, some of us need to know and understand that he loves you and that he's for you. And just like Mary and Joseph, you might suffer reproach but I want you to know that you are in the will of God. Sometimes we make decisions, myself included, that are just dumb. Sometimes they're sinful. Sometimes I look at it and I go, God, how can I have known you for so long, yet I still fall, I still stumble? I hate myself for doing it. How, how, how can I do that? I love you, Lord. You know, when God wrote 
that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, still applies right now. Christian bar of soap found in 1 John, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christian bar of soap, man. That word never changes. We heard it this morning. Jesus changes not. He's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. We know this. Yet during those times, we kind of think, yeah, but you don't know, Scott. I've stuffed up really bad. I've done this. I've done that. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. If you think that you can go beyond the point where God can't heal you, that God can't do a miracle, then you probably need to read the passage of Scripture that we just referred to before. With God, all things are possible. He doesn't change. Do we need to repent? Absolutely. Absolutely. And repentance is not just an attitude. It is an action, by the way. It does mean I need to stop what I'm doing. But at the same time, God knows that we are only human, that we stumble and we fall and we try. But we love God. Don't you find it funny that the scripture declares that a righteous man might fall seven times? Yet in the end, he gets up. Well, how the heck can he be righteous if he's falling? Because he's a man. It's as simple as that. And I love this, what it says. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Anyone called this morning? Anyone called this morning? I've got more than five. That's not like calling like you and I in our Western society think, you know, I'm called to the ministry. That means you're saved. That means he loved you enough to save you. You're the called. Oh, Jesus. Those he called, he also justified. Yeah? Just as if I'd never sinned. Praise God. And those he justified, he also glorified. This, friends, is your destiny. Are you encouraged this morning? Yes. Yes. Musos, why don't you come? You fantastic people. I finished a little bit early today. You're welcome. I hope that when you read Romans chapter 8, you will never read it the same again. For God works all things together for the good of those that love him, who, have been, who are that called according to his purpose. I'm here to declare to you this morning that his purposes are always good. Why? Well, God's good. He can't help but be good. He's a God of love, God of grace, God of mercy. And if you're here this morning, if you don't mind, just while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, just to give people some privacy during this time of prayer, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise up their hand. I'm not going to point anyone out. This is a time that I don't want you to raise your hand. What I do want you to do is to be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself and before God who sees everything. Only you know whether or not you've really committed your life to Christ. Only you know whether or not you really are born again. The Bible says, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. It also says that he loved you enough that he gave his son Jesus, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I pray that if you are one of those this morning, You know who you are. Perhaps you're even watching on YouTube or whatever it is, Facebook. 
I just pray that this season you'd come to know Jesus, that you would get saved. You need salvation. You need Jesus. There's no other way to heaven except through Jesus this morning. That He loves you. His grace is towards you. It's for you. He's not against you. Romans 8, actually 31, just at the end of that passage, actually says, what shall we say then in response to this? For if our God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. He did not spare his own son. For you. For you. So Father, I pray for those ones that may be here this morning that do need your presence, that do need to be saved this morning. I pray, Lord, they wouldn't leave this place without first asking the question to someone. Even asking the question to you, Lord, would you please forgive me? Would you please save me? Would you please cleanse me of all unrighteousness? And I know, Lord, your word says that you're a good God and faithful and just to forgive anyone that comes to you. That you will not turn anyone who comes to you away. Thank you, Lord, for this time of Christmas. May we, as your people, understand and celebrate the birth of your son. Plan A has always been and always will be. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough, Lord God, that you didn't leave us alone, that you came to rescue us. But even more than that, you came to justify us and you came to glorify us. So undeserved this grace towards us, Lord. And during this time, Father, I just pray that you would receive all the glory, all the honour, all the power, all the might, all the dominion. In fact, Father, we pray that at every Christmas carol, Lord God, when they sing songs like Hark the Herald Angels Sing and, and true Christmas songs that are about you, I pray, Holy Spirit, we pray together, Holy Spirit, that you would do something amazing, something great, that the gospel message would go out, Father, that people would be saved this Christmas time. Truly come to know you, Lord God. Let your grace be outpoured, Father. Let he who blinds their eyes take off the veil in the name of Jesus this Christmas time. And may people come to know you. Families come to know you. And may your grace, Lord, abound. We pray these things, Father, in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.